He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Have you ever had a song get stuck in your head and you've been listening to it in the car and it's just on replay constantly in your mind for the rest of the week? Wouldn't it be awesome if we as a church could memorize Colossians 1, 15 through 17 so that those words, the words that we just heard in this bumper every week, that as they play before the sermon, we would hear them in our own hearts and minds, that we'd be able to say them out loud together. Because the real reason why we do things like that and why we want to set this challenge as a church to memorize these words uh, is not so that we can just make a check and say, aren't we good Christians, we know a Bible verse. It's so that we can remind ourselves that this one who we are talking about in this series, this Jesus, really is the Lord of all things. The one who's loved us. This is who he is and we want to know him. As Paul prayed last week in Colossians 1 when he prayed that we'd be filled with the knowledge of God's will. We want to know him. So uh, we are continuing our series this morning on Colossians 1. And as we start, I want to talk about remakes because we live in the era of remakes right now. Some of you, I'm sure, saw the remake of The Lion King this summer. Um, and I was talking with some of the middle school students, some of you guys might be in here, uh, talking about it, and some of them didn't even know there was an original Lion King. That is disgusting. <laughs> I uh, urge you, church family, educate your kids on better Disney movies because they're stuck on Frozen, and they don't even know that classics like this existed. But uh, I never um, have been a big fan of the remakes of stuff like this because the first one was such a big part of my childhood. You know, I don't want to wreck it and mess it up. Uh, but we don't really have to wait that long even for remakes these days because they happen so quickly. Actually, since 2002, there have been three different Spider-Man franchises. They change it up every few years, right? A new actor, a new costume. Uh, I've seen every single one probably more than I should uh, and think about them more than I should. But w what I find interesting about this is that we're constantly trying to make him a little bit more relevant, right? Like they change little details of the story or the way that he says certain things or the memorable details just to make him a little bit more relevant, a little bit more engaging. And then the la latest movie that I've had is about to get a Hollywood remake is The Princess Bride. Yes, it's inconceivable. It's terrible that they would touch this sacred movie. But these days, there is nothing off limits to a remake. There's absolutely nothing because we live in a culture that really enjoys remaking things. We like taking a little bit of creative liberty and spinning things in a different light and trying to see it a different way. And sometimes that can be a really, really good thing. Some of the most creative things can come out when we do that. But it can become a really, really bad thing when we do that with Jesus. When we are inclined to change the idea and the message of Jesus to be a little different, maybe a little bit more as we see it relevant or engaging or something that we can connect with easier. Because the truth is, there's nothing better than the original. The Jesus that the Bible presents us with, who he is, what he's done, is the best possible picture of who God is because it is really who he is. And that's what Paul's concern is as he's writing this letter to this young church in Colossae. As they are figuring out what it means to follow Jesus, one of the first things and one of the most important things Paul wants them to get is who Jesus really is. Because just like us, despite living such a long time ago and far away, they lived in a culture that was apt to do a little bit of remaking, to take a little bit of creative liberty. And they were surrounded by all kinds of different religions and spiritual ideas that at the heart of all of them was this idea that they could change and create their own kind of customized spirituality. And now probably they're facing a temptation to have a customized Jesus and Paul says, there's a better picture. And so he writes this amazing passage, one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. So thrilled to speak on it this morning and unfortunately I only get 30 minutes to do so because to talk about this, really, we, we can't even begin to scratch the surface of what Paul is presenting us with in 30 minutes. But we're going to try and take a look at the heart of what he's really saying. The heart of this picture of Jesus that Paul paints. Because he paints for them, the church in Colossae, a Jesus who is the creator of all things. A Jesus who is the goal of all things. And a Jesus who is the reconciler of all things. So I want to read this together in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 23. This is what Paul writes he is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The first thing that Paul tells the Colossians about Jesus is that Jesus is the creator of all things. He's the creator of all things. Now, have you ever been on a family vacation where you've went to see some kind of spectacular sight, some amazing sight, and when you get there, there's always one person in the family who's not quite as thrilled and amazed by what you're beholding as the rest of everybody. Maybe perhaps you go to the Statue of Liberty or you go to Washington DC and you see these amazing sights, but there's always one person who doesn't quite catch what's going on around them. Well, I have a picture that I wanna show you that I found this week from a friend of mine that is the perfect depiction of this. Uh, and I, I asked permission first, but I want to show you this. This is the Chenault family at the Great Wall of China. Okay, the Great Wall of China, one of the most amazing sites in the world. And if you zone in, if you can see the little girl in the front, Kenneth Chenault in the pink shirt, she's not quite as thrilled as everybody else to be at one of the greatest locations on earth. Everybody else is smiling, happy, but Kenneth doesn't just quite get it. She doesn't really see what the fuss is, right? And just so you know that I don't just pick on other people's kids, here's a picture of my son. <laughs> when he was told he was about to have a little brother, right? This amazing moment, there's a new person coming into our family. He didn't quite catch it, he didn't get it. Not the way that we wanted him to. And really, there's a little bit of a problem in both these pictures that I think we all share. And that problem is a problem of awe. A problem of being able to see what's right there in front of us. Because Paul is now telling us about a Jesus who is the creator of all things. And he's doing this because Paul knows that we are apt to not really see Jesus for who he really is. We're inclined in our hearts sometimes to make him out to be a little bit less and a little bit less amazing than he really is because Jesus is amazing. This is what Paul writes. He says he's the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. By him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Paul paints this picture of Jesus. And this actual, the text that we look at today in the Bible was an early hymn in the church. It's something that the church would sing to remind themselves to look at Jesus and know who he really is. That he is not just another religious figure, not just another religious teacher, but Jesus is God. Jesus is God the creator of everything. Paul is saying because he's the image of the invisible God, when we see Jesus, we are quite literally seeing God. Not just someone who knows about him or teaches well about him, but who is himself God. And that should drive us to do two things. Whenever we see this picture of Jesus, the first, we should be filled with awe. We should be blown away and amazed that this is who Jesus is. Blown away by this almighty God this creator of everything who would come and make himself known to us, come and live amongst us and walk with us. That's amazing. Humbling himself like that. If when you think of Jesus, he's not all that thrilling to you, then I wanna encourage you this morning that there's a better picture of Jesus waiting for you, probably than the one that you've got. Because if he doesn't blow you away, you haven't quite yet seen everything of who he is. And I think that this happens because we kind of inclined to do a little bit of editing. Like I've already said, we are inclined to do a little bit of remaking of Jesus. And the truth is, is that Jesus is much bigger than most of the pictures that we paint of him. Jesus is so much bigger than a lot of the pictures that we paint of him. 
Sometimes we say things of Jesus like, he's our homeboy, he's my friend, and those things are kind of half-truths because he really is our friend who loves us, the one who walked in life like us, but he is also God incarnate. Jesus is not like Muhammad. Jesus is not like Buddha. He is not like any other religious figure in history because all of those other people claimed to be teachers and spiritual gurus, but Jesus claimed to be God, the one who knit us together in our mother's wombs, the one who knows everything about us, who dreamed us up. That's who Jesus is. Every galaxy, every star, every planet that is above us, that ones even that we can't see, Jesus put them in place by the word of his power, breathed them out of nothingness. And if that's who Jesus is, then it leads us to a second thing as well. It leads us to a second thing, that he is not only someone who should fill us with awe, but he is someone to whom we should submit our lives. Because if Jesus is the creator of all things, then he is the highest authority in existence. If Jesus is the one for whom all things were made, there is no one whose direction and leadership matters more than his. Whether it's your marriage, your job, your friendships, your finances, your body, your spare time, if Jesus is God, then he has the right to speak into all of those things and redirect them however he chooses. Paul Tripp, one of my favorite pastors, says this about this passage in Colossians. He says that, Worship is designed to remind you that the world is ruled by a wise, gracious, and capable king, and he is not you. When we read something like this in Colossians, a picture of Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, who's before all things, above all things, in all things, holding all things together, then that should drive us not only to be filled with awe, but to realize he is the only worthy king in existence. See, early Christians, as I've already said, worship to this hymn, to this passage, they would sing of it, to remind themselves of the great God that had come to be amongst them, the one who'd loved them, and the one to whom they wanted to submit their lives gladly. They were in awe of his power and authority, and Paul's charge to the Colossians is to always be in awe of Jesus' power and authority. And the reminder for us today as we read this amazing letter is to be in awe of Jesus' power and authority, and to never let that pass us by, never stop looking at that. The next thing that Paul directs us to see in this passage is that Jesus is the goal of all things. He is the goal of all things. Now, one of the things I love most in the world is playing games with my little boys. Every day when I come home from work, they always rush to the door and say, play with us, daddy, play with us. And one of their favorite games is Hungry Hippos. Now, Hungry Hippos, if you're a parent of small children, is not an enjoyable game because it's a fragile piece of plastic in which everybody is slamming their hands down as hard as they can. Uh, But Jonathan especially loves to play this game, my oldest. And the point of this game, if you're familiar, obviously, is that you put all the little balls in the middle and you've got to make your hippo eat as many of them as you can. But you'll also notice there's a yellow one. Now, I do not know what that yellow ball is for. Maybe some of you are more uh, educated on these games. I looked through the rule book and I couldn't find anything. But I can tell you what it means to my son Jonathan. It means if you get the yellow ball, you win the game. Regardless of how many balls everybody else gets, if you get the yellow one, you're the winner. It's like the golden snitch in Harry Potter. Well, that's not how the game works. The game works on whoever gets the most. So there has been many times where I've won the game, but he says, no, no, you didn't get the yellow one, I win. Uh, And then what's even worse when you feel really bad as a dad is when you get the yellow one and he busts out crying because now you feel really bad. You say, no, it's okay. You got like 30 balls. It's okay. It's like, well, he didn't get the yellow one. And the problem for my son is that he doesn't quite get the goal of Hungry Hippos. And we talk about it, we explain it, but he doesn't quite get the goal of it. And I think sometimes in life we can become very lost as to what the goal of life is. The goal of everything around us. What's the goal of this life that we live? Well, Paul says the goal is Jesus. The goal of all things is Jesus. He finishes that last passage that we just read, the start of this. He says that all things were created through Jesus for Jesus. And he goes on to say, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Some of the Bibles translate that supreme that Jesus would be supreme, the one who's above everything, the center of attention, the one to whom everything points, 
That's why everything that exists in our universe exists is to glorify Jesus, to lift him up and to show his creativity and his power and his goodness. And that is why you were created as well. Why God breathed life into you is so that you could be an image bearer, so that you could show the world what he is like, so that you could love as he has loved, create as he has created. All of us exist for the purpose of lifting up Jesus. Do you know that the Christian life is not mainly about you and I becoming better people? The Christian life is not even mainly about you and I going to heaven one day if we follow everything that Jesus tells us to. The Christian life, the main point is to lift up Jesus in all of creation, to show him to the world so the world would see what he's like, so that the world would see that he is preeminent, supreme over all things. And sometimes I think we as Christians can do a little bit of a bad job in making Jesus preeminent. Sometimes we can accept that he's the creator God and we understand that he's made all these amazing things, but there's so many other things going on in life that Jesus kind of gets bumped down the list and he ends up not really being the center of attention. Sometimes finances get in the way. We've got to make sure that everything's figured out financially and so we don't have too much time to think about Jesus. And when we do get a spare second, it's spent on family or work or any number of other things, making sure that the grades are right in school, making sure that things are going okay with friends. A long list of things that become the goal instead of Jesus. And if Jesus really is God and the maker of all things, then he should be the goal of all things. And I can't possibly touch on all those, but I wanna talk about three things that Jesus should be the goal of this morning. The first thing is he should be the goal of our faith. And that can seem like it's a little bit self-evident. Of course, he should be the goal of the faith, but I think we live in a way that sometimes doesn't display that he's the goal of our faith. Other things become the goal. I said a moment ago, maybe the goal becomes, I wanna be a good person. I wanna make sure that I'm doing all the right things and marking all the right things off in the list, which can be a good thing if done the right way, but that shouldn't be the goal. The goal shouldn't just simply to be more moral people. The goal also shouldn't simply be that when we get to the end of our life, one day we can go to heaven and get everything we want because as John Piper once noted, if you get to heaven and Jesus isn't there, then it won't be heaven. Jesus is just as much the goal of heaven as he is of this life and so when we think about this life, we shouldn't simply make the goal to get done. The goal should be to lift up Jesus. Are you telling other people about him? When you're praying with him, are you mostly asking for things for yourself or are you asking for ways that you can know him better? Are you growing in your awareness of your need for Jesus? Are you spending time reflecting on the difference that he has made in your life? Thanking him for the difference that he's made in your life. Are you serving, finding places to give your life to others so that they can see Jesus and lift him up? Jesus should also be the goal of our personal lives. Not just our faith, but our personal lives. This means that we keep in mind that all the details of our personal lives are given to us as opportunities to lift up Jesus. Paul talks about this very kind of thing when he says in some of his other letters in the Bible that our marriages are a reflection of Christ and the church, of Jesus and the church, because when we love our spouse as Christ loved us, then that shows a picture to the world of who Jesus really is when we live sacrificially and selflessly, and we serve. And that's not just for marriages either, although Paul talks about that, really what Paul is saying can be applied to any of our relationships, any of our personal relationships, is the goal of your relationships with people for them to better understand the grace of Jesus and to see who he is, or is it something else? The last thing he doesn't want to say, and again, it seems self-evident, but I'm going to say it anyway, Jesus should be the goal of church. He should be the goal of all of our gatherings here at church. Now, the reason why I say that is because although I think we all do believe that, sometimes we can approach church a little bit like a consumer. What's going on at church that I want to engage in for me? What, what is there that will serve my needs? Is there good programming? Is there good events? Is the music good? All these things can be important things and good things, but they shouldn't be the goal. See, consumer Christianity, where the primary point of church is to serve us, very quickly 
starts to take Jesus out of the spot of preeminence and importance and starts to put ourselves there instead. And when we come together to worship, the point of all this is to lift up Jesus. One of the reasons why we serve at church on Sunday is to create as much of an experience as possible that lifts up Jesus. And so I wanna recognize the hundreds of people in our church family that serve on Sunday mornings in all the different ways to help us lift up Jesus. We have greeters at the door who give their time to welcome people and love people so that there's a picture of Jesus as you walk in the building, someone who welcomes us and loves us. Or about a sound team that often goes unnoticed, but they are helping to create an amazing worship experience where we can all sing these amazing songs to Jesus. A slides team that always makes me, Jeff, Brian, and Sterling and Joe look a lot cooler than we really are by serving. Or about all the childcare workers downstairs that are giving their time and their energy. And they're doing this because their job and the jobs of all the people I have aforementioned are just as important as anyone behind a guitar on stage or behind a pulpit on stage because it's all about Jesus. Every detail. We strive to do that because we want Jesus to be lifted high. We want him to be preeminent. The last thing that Paul wants us to see in this passage is that Jesus is the reconciler of all things. Jesus is the reconciler of all things. He's what he says to close out this amazing passage. He says, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you had, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. See, the crescendo of this little hymn, this little passage that became such an important part of the early church, is Jesus, as the reconciler of all things. Paul wants the Colossian church to see that this creator God who put everything that is into motion, who is himself the goal of everything that exists, that same God chose to give up the splendor of heaven for the wood of a cross and to do that for you and me because of an amazing love that he had for us. And the only reason why Jesus can be a reconciler is because he is God, is because he is the maker of all things and because he is the goal of all things. If he was not those things, he could not reconcile us because our primary problem as people is that we have been alienated from God. That's what Paul says in this passage, that as he goes through all these things that Jesus is, the first thing that he says about you and I is that we were alienated from God and hostile in mind to no one more so than God. And so... Only God himself can bring us back to him. So he sends Jesus. He sends us his son. Because none of us start out recognizing God as the creator of all things. We all have played the game of sitting on the throne in our lives and deciding what our lives should look like and how they should go. All of us have made the mistake of making something other than Jesus the goal in life. Whether it's comfort, security, wealth, success, Friends, yeah, I want you to see this, that this God who has been alienated by us, rejected by us, forgotten by us, chooses to take Jesus, who is the crowning jewel of all creation, the one for whom everything points towards, the uncreated firstborn of God. He sends him for us. He gives the most precious thing in the entire universe for us. This is what Tom Wright says about this passage in Colossians, he says, reconciliation affected through the death of the son reveals most clearly the love of the father. It is this revelation that calls forth the praises to heaven to which Paul now invites the Colossians to join their voices. Jesus is not one more rival to the gods of paganism. He reigns supreme over all. He has given himself to his world in loving self-sacrifice to create out of sinful humanity a people for his own possession with the intention of eventually bringing the entire universe into a new order and harmony. Jesus, the creator God, who alone deserves glory and adoration, traded the splendor of heaven for you and I. 
what a picture of his love. And there was another picture recently in the news that I can't help but speak about this morning because it was such a great picture of the very thing that we're talking about this morning. If you have been following the news, you will have no doubt heard of the trial of a woman called Amber Geiger. Uh, Amber Geiger was an off-duty police officer who went into the home uh, of a man and shot him dead inside of his own home while he was eating his breakfast. And the reason she gave for this was that she thought she was in our own home. So Amber was arrested and uh, rightfully sentenced for what she did. Uh, and at her sentencing uh, was the brother of the victim. The victim was named Botham Jean. And his brother Brant Jean went to the stand because it's common in trials like this that the victim's uh, family get to speak to the one uh, who's being sentenced. And so Brant takes the stand. And this is what he said. If you truly are sorry, I can speak for myself. I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I don't think anyone can say it. And again, I'm speaking for myself, but I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I presently want the best for you. And I wasn't ever going to say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. The best would be to give your life to Christ. And if that wasn't enough, Brant Jean then asked the judge if he could do something else and he stepped down from the stand to hug his brother's murderer. And he did this because of Jesus. He openly said as much that he did this because of Jesus. Because Brant knew that he had been forgiven that he had been reconciled to God through Christ. Now, I, I want you to understand something because if we don't, we will miss the relevance of this whole image. Amber Geiger did not deserve to be forgiven and neither do you and I. The things that we've used our life for, all the things that we've done instead of lifting up Jesus as the goal and recognizing God as the maker of all things, we don't deserve to be forgiven by that. But the good news this morning is, that doesn't matter. He did it anyway. Because we didn't murder God's brother, we murdered his son. Jesus hung on a cross in a way that was much more horrible than any of us can imagine. And the Bible tells us that when he did that, he did it for the joy set before him. We are that joy. We are the ones that he wanted to reconcile to his father so that as Paul now says, as though we started off alienated and hostile in mind, we now stand before God holy and blameless because this creator, this goal of all things came to love us to himself. There is nothing more important in the gospel than the understanding that Jesus has loved you even though you didn't deserve it and couldn't ever earn it so much so that he would give what is most precious in all of creation to bring you back to himself. He would give us Jesus, the creator of all things, Jesus, the goal of all things, and Jesus, the reconciler of all things. So please do not let the culture and experience of our lives remake Jesus into anything other than the Jesus that the Bible tells us about. Because any picture we come up with of Jesus is not as good as this one. There is nothing better than the truth of who he really is. Come. Come to the true and living Jesus who alone can redeem you, reconcile you, heal you, and restore you. The Jesus who loves you. Because he is preeminent over all things. And there is no name greater in all of creation. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, we thank you for your son who is more precious than we could possibly deserve, yet you give him freely to us. You give him with joy to us. And Lord, I pray that we would come to him this morning and see him as the creator of all things, the one who formed us in our mother's wombs, as the goal of all things, the one who is supreme over every authority and every throne, and that we would see him as the reconciler of all things, the one who has loved us and embraced us Lord, we love your son and we are so grateful for him. We pray in his name, amen.